Good morning from Normandy. 80 years ago today, hundreds of thousands of men and some women, ordinary people, were asked to do the extraordinary D-Day, a day that turned the tide of history. And it, to put it bluntly, we are all here today because of what they did on that day. Now, I'm at the site of the, the memorial specifically for the British fallen, because for many, many years, there wasn't one. The Americans had one, the French had one, the Canadians hadn't one. But after huge campaigning from the veterans and the British Legion and those that supported them, we now have this extraordinary structure that is so moving to be amongst with column after column of the names of the teenagers and the young men who fell to give us our freedom. Now, I know it looks very, very beautiful this morning. It was around this time on D-Day that the some 7,000 ships crossed the channel and embarked on this extraordinary mission. Many of them, by the way, didn't actually know where they were going. They, they knew in part that this was an attempt at freeing Western Europe. But some of them have told me that as they left Portsmouth, they thought, oh, we're not turning left to Norway, we're turning right to France. That is the degree of what they didn't know to prepare for. Shall I paint you a picture of this beautiful scene and what it would have looked like 80 years ago today. So it covered a 50-mile stretch, the target of the largest ever amphibious assault with land, sea and air involved, starting over in the east with Sword Beach, where British and Canadian troops came abroad, then Juno, where the Canadians were, then across here to Gold Beach, some 700 miles down, which is where the most of the British service personnel came aboard, and then on round to Omaha, where so many Americans lost their lives. A brutal battle there. And then round, I don't know if you can see the Mulberry Harbours, but then Utah as well. And it is a struggle to really comprehend what these young men went through. So we went down onto Gold Beach. Just a beautiful French police. The, the, type of place you'd want to spend your holiday and we did that walk that they would have done now on the day 80 years ago at this hour the whole of the sea was full of 7,000 ships you couldn't see the horizon and when the Germans became aware the Nazis became aware that this was happening of course, they launched their incredible fortress across this 50 miles with guns and minefields and snipers to attack those 25,000 British troops that tried to come on shore. And as we walked up, one of the things that they encountered on that day, because remember, it was a very small window where they could do this between a storm the day before, where it had to be postponed, and bad weather they knew was coming. When they did this, they didn't predict how quickly the tide would come in. Many of the young men never made it onto the beach because the tide was so deep. They fell in the water, tried to swim, and their kit weighed them down. The waves were, in places, four to six feet high. And as they came onto the shore, these poor souls, were met with extraordinary resistance. And then as we walked back up the walk, which is easier to do now, of course, not least because it's not got the chaos, the screams, the sound, the fire that they have been telling me filled the air, but also because the tracks are easier to do. It was the most strange sensation to think what they would have been going through that day. And I don't know if you can see in some of the pictures that you have, but, in fact, what is standing there now are silhouettes of the 1,750-odd people, just the British service personnel, who died on that journey up that hill to the, where we are at the memorial on that day. And I found it very moving to see the, the servicemen, the sailors. There are two women, two nurses as well who just, you know, were standing like shadows of the past. 
Now, this commemoration, uh, we wanted to be here, Good Morning Britain, specifically because we know in reality that the vets, veterans who've survived that we'll be talking to this morning are in their late 90s and 100s. And if we don't capture their thoughts and their memories to keep that flame of resemblance alive, put brutally, it will be lost. Um, so we will be talking to them throughout the morning and looking at the other things to mark the day that will be going on. And at 6.25, your time, British time this morning, a piper will play to commemorate the exact moment the first British soldier landed on the French coastline. And throughout the morning, we're going to speak to many of them who've retraced their route here to Normandy and for whom today promises to bring back deeply emotional memories. Now, there is no doubt they're all heroes. No one thinks of themselves as one. They all deny that completely. But, but we, Good Morning Britain, and I'm sure you do too, want to celebrate their extraordinary delivery for all of us that came at such great sacrifice and cost. And as you can see, there is a lot happening to commemorate it. There are fly paths. And here at the British Normandy Memorial, well, there's a lot going on. Uh, this is the RF Music Band, who promised me that for the next few minutes they won't start their rehearsals. <laughs> Thank you, boys and girls. Um, they are getting ready for the big commemoration in about an hour or so's time when the King and the Queen will be here to meet veterans. But I brought you back here not just to see their setting up, but to really see the scale of this memorial. If we turn round, Look at this. These are the names of those that fell on that first day of the Normandy campaign on D-Day. There are 130 odd of these columns. And I want to draw you, Rav, who's on our cameras over here, up to about the second column up, where there's the name Dern E.W., Edward William Dern. He is 17. He was the youngest to fall on D-Day. And his parents, who were, didn't know he was even here before he was here, and then when they found out of his loss, as the news came through, said, into the mosaic of victory we lay our most precious peace. And I just think about all the parents, all the brothers, the sisters, the children, all of those who on this day laid their most precious piece into the mosaic of victory. And they so felt so strongly about that, they put that on his gravestone at a cemetery for the war dead when eventually the bodies were recovered and they had a chance to bury their dead just a few miles from here. And I went there yesterday to have a look at that cemetery again the scale of the numbers takes your breath away. And there, too, were some veterans, the surviving members, the heroes of that day, who travelled to be there, too. And one of them is John Live. Now, he is 100 years old, and the passion with which he wanted to make this journey, because he knew he may not see another... D-Day commemoration was overwhelming and I sat down him amongst those gravestones to speak about his memories of that day. I had a very great friend who's only 18, well, so was I really. <laughs> I had to go up this slope slightly to get to the top of the ramp which he went down to get on the beach. To the beach, yeah. And I was I su successfully managed that, but uh, as I was the next one, my very good, good friend next to me, he was behind, and I glanced back just to see if he was he was all right. But he got one in the throat, and he was dead. I, 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 sorry. You see the shells coming over, you hear them coming, and then there's a plop, there's a fill in the sea. I remember saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with those, look. <laughs> but, of course, it wasn't like that. It no. got a bit nasty. 
What are your feelings coming back here? Coming back? Well, I was pleased to, because mm. uh, it's, it's always fascinating, that effort to land as we did. And um, so that was one item. But mm. then, of course, there was other, on the other side, things weren't so nice. Seen, yeah. uh, colleagues being killed and that. So, so yeah, it's... Um, <laughs> Bit of each, really. Do you feel like a hero? Oh, no. No, there's too many people helping you, really, to be a hero. No, I, we, I finished up, but we eventually got off the beach and went through France and uh, Belgium, Holland, and up into Germany. And then, of course, the, we had the armistice with the Germans. And um, uh, one of our people appeared with a crate of uh, Dutch gin, which she, she issued around, which I, <laughs> I never, never drunk that stuff, but I did on that occasion. I uh, bet you did, and rightly so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for everything on behalf of everybody watching our programme and, and everybody in the world. It's right. amazing. Yes. Uh, and he was amazing in his humility. One of the first things he said was, I'm so sorry for your loss to me about the passing of Derek, my husband. And the idea that he knew that and thought of that with all he'd been through, I just said to him, look, there would have been no Derek as it was, there would have been no me, there would have been no any of our lives without what you did. And he cried and we held hands. And, and it's hard to overstate, really, how important it is for them that we remember and how important it is for us that we remember too. Philippa Rawlinson is here with me. You are the director of Rem Remembrance, aren't you, for the Royal British Legion. Why do we need to have events like this, particularly this one, uh, and why should we find it so important to remember? Well, I think, starting where you ended, why should we think find it so important to remember? I think, you know, remembering unites us and makes us think about where we've come from mm -hmm. and um, what we've, we've achieved together with our allies, particularly here as we stand above Gold Beach, where we, we came ashore with our allies and, uh, you know, 80 years ago. And it's really important to remember those veterans that we have with us and to listen to those stories like John. I came across with him on the ferry two days ago. Uh, it's such a humble man, as you say. I mean, he also was so full of life. on that ferry, wasn't he? Yes. Oh, but when I asked him about it, um, he said... <laughs> He said, oh, it was just better than the last time, because then I was really seasick, you know, the last time being D-Day. And, and of course, he was one of the first to show there. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, John and the other 20 veterans that are, are travelling with the RBL yes. have really been sharing their stories mm. with each other, with us, and they'll be sharing them more stories again today with those gathering around us here at the British Normandy Memorial. You say 20. Of course, five years ago, there were 300-odd British surviving veterans and that i think escalates the importance of why we wanted to bring our show from here today because we have to capture those memories don't we to make sure that our children and their children know what happened here now in amongst the solemnity and thinking of those that lost their lives there is a lot of activity philippa absolutely All around me look i don't know rav if you can look around but we've got the rf music band we've got gatherings of soldiers we've got chairs being laid out <laughs> we've got marquees and this of course is because the king and queen will be attending and we know how important it was for the king particularly and i'm sure the queen too to actually be here today despite his own hill health that will be important for the veterans as well. It will it? be, because actually, you know, the anniversary, the 80th anniversary, mm. gives us an opportunity to shine a spotlight on their stories. The yeah. fact that the King and the Queen and, you know, many other people are making the trip here to listen to those stories. Yes. And so we're going to be sharing them with the world as yes. well as, as we broadcast from here. But also, you know, capturing them in our Legacies of D-Day exhibition that the Royal British Legion has here 
um, for three years at, in, at the British Normandy Memorial, at the National Memorial Arboretum for the summer and online. Just capturing those stories, not in mm. events, but in exhibitions, so that they can, they can live on. Mm. And of course, at the, with the Royal British Legion, we have all of our teaching resources as well. Very keen to share stories mm. and what it means to, to mm. serve for our country mm. and why we should remember them with the next generation. One veteran said to me yesterday, and you're absolutely right, and I urge everybody to look at those exhibitions and come here for a holiday, and and because it's a beautiful it's place beautiful. to be and think about it. But one veteran said to me yesterday, with the nearly 1,500 statues of those that lost their lives, the British people that lost their lives on D-Day, um, he said, I wish I could bring a whole year of my grandchildren's school and get them to stand by every single Ooh. statue and feel that that is the year of their school wiped out and then set them the task of researching the person that they stood next to. And I thought, my goodness, uh, I'm not sure who the next uh, Secretary of State for Education is, but maybe that should be the first thing they do after the election because wouldn't that be incredible?